Thank you. I um, have been unable to come to uh, uh, talks, and that's been my loss. It's always like this. You're on the run. You're preparing your talks. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, really something that one regrets. But I uh, did uh, make it a point to come and listen to Edwin this morning, and I'm very glad that I did. I thought that was a fantastic talk, first of all, and secondly, uh, I got a lot of, uh, as did all of you, a lot of bibliographic information, which is very, very useful indeed. So uh, I'm uh, happy that at least I came to one. And I told Edwin something, therefore I will not have to, uh, I know he will mention it next time because he like fully agreed. It's a person who was not perhaps our favorite person, but certainly <laughs> in the context of translation, he has to be mentioned. Paul Engel of the International Writing Program at, uh, at the University of Iowa. So, in fact, it was at his behest, in, and I was not a professional Indian for him. I despise uh, being st standing in, you know, as an upper caste Bengali, standing in for the so-called indigenous. Uh, I don't like that. And P Paul was one of the very first ones who actually, post Bandung, who invited us to do that, and I wasn't one. So uh, th this is something that he didn't like very much, but nonetheless, he has to be, uh, he has to be admired and remembered. And um, I met, as I say, Ngugiwa Thiongo, Okot Pitek, all these people, uh, Jose uh, Donoso, uh, you name it. I met them through International Writing Program in the 60s. So this is an important moment. But one thing I didn't mention, Edwin, is, and perhaps uh, someone here has talked, I mean, I don't know because I haven't been able to listen to them, uh, is the um, tradition of Arab translation. I mean, uh, you know, the, they translated from Aristotle. I mean, after all, Aristotle had to be fought for by Thomas Aquinas so that uh, people could say, Christianize Aristotle, which is not stopped yet. The, one should just look at the translation of Aristotle, how very Christianized it still is, even in the low classical edition. That's not how Ibn Rushd uh, dealt with Aristotle at all. So to an extent, all the way from Aristotle to the Upanishads, the Panchatantras, the, you name it, the Arabs were the incredible force, in, uh, the first force in translation. And the funniest thing is that, and I mention it in this room because this is a very serious, perhaps the most important translation enterprise at work and radiating today. Although the Western translations of um, the Arabs is very well annotated, there's not a really good significant book on the Eastern translations. And in order to, um, in order to uh, do deal with that, we need someone who doesn't just know uh, Arabic and Sanskrit and the Eastern languages, but also Pahlavi. And we really need a young, uh, dedicated person to write one of those massive and wonderful annotated dissertations, which will then start something. And I just want to mention that need because this is the appropriate place, and we really should acknowledge this. Um, the, even Larry, in fact, remember I was talking about the guy, the Esperanto uh, guy, uh, the um, uh, head of the American Esperantic Society who used to give me money when I was, not me personally, but the institute that I was directing every year for half a postdoc if it related to translation. And so Larry and I were actually lecturing together for him, University of Hartford. And when I mentioned the Arabs, in fact, Larry mentioned the modern Middle East rather than, I mean, I'm sure he has corrected that, He's, but at that point, he really didn't even pick up on what I was talking about, and I think that is really a significant absence. And um, I would also like to say, and we, we'll talk about it when I come to Rosa Luxemburg, that, you know, when one thinks about, and I'm very glad you mentioned the Sykes-Picot, because I will mention books, two books, about um, <coughs> Shannon uh, yesterday when we were discussing uh, your notion of a broader, um, you hear, right, Shannon? Yes, a broader um, understanding of translation, and I said we have to watch it because the word might become useless. But on the other hand, sometimes we need it, as you well know. And when we talk about, when I talk about this book, uh, the two books that I've put there, I am going to talk about the 
geography of the Middle East, so-called, right? But what we also have to think about is that the classic case of border scandal is Africa. You know, so, and the whole language situation, that's a model. This is why I've mentioned a very thin book. Okay, this is not a book that only specialists read. In a nice thin book published by Hopkins Press, Wuhan, um, African Perspectives on Colonialism. I don't, and he also, you know, um, uh, James, uh, like you and me, he doesn't just simply say, oh, colonialism, bad, bad, essentializing colonialism. Because, uh, the, you know, the, he, uh, the chapter in which he talks about the advantages and disadvantages of colonialism, if you are really like a gung-ho, essentialist, colonized, good, colonialist, bad, you won't like that chapter. But, you know, but where he talks about, uh, talks about the border scandal, he's so clear for the non-specialist that I think one really needs not only to think about uh, the trying to, do, and you know, the writing of the Middle East, um, Edwin, was not just that the Middle East was written because the Ottomans had to be taken care of, but also that the promises to the Arab muftis and for Arab independence, Arab control, were broken. They did not find out until much later that the Western powers had rewritten that map, um, establishing the Holy Land as a condominium. That's the word in the Sykes-Pico conversations, right? And the only place that could carry arms was the, the, the Western. That was the holy emergence of the Holy Land. So to re-emergence of the Holy Land. And we are gonna put our missionary translations today in that context also. So uh, the, um, at any rate, so therefore, I just wanted to say these two things. Remember the, not the Alamo, that is also something that should be remembered, but, 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 but remember, all right, remember the Arabs in this way and get a dissertation going for the Eastern translations. And then also, in terms of the scandal of geography, rewriting the world, you should not forget Africa. Because, and especially in terms of what you were talking about, James, the, what, the 270 languages of Cameroon? Yes, yeah, so to an extent, and in what way those borders, and Congo, in fact, I have a brother from Congo here, and Congo is one of the biggest scandals as uh, Boahan shows, and to an extent that's what created all of these uh, problems, a huge uh, thing compared to the Gambia, which is tiny. What the hell were they thinking about? Let's not go there, I will never stop. So, um, so let me cut to the chase. Yesterday I talked about, uh, yesterday I talked about gender as an instrument of abstraction. I, I, as a person who learned English as a foreign language and became quite good at it, I am very careful. I have a problem, which is my prose is too difficult because of intellectual insecurity, which I've got over by now, that part. But I have an, a good thing also. I'm exceedingly precise about the words I use, okay? So please remember, instrument, like a tool, because there are certain differences that are perceptible by people, even if they are completely uneducated. So this idea of man stronger, woman uh, gets pregnant, woman must be protected, a woman's honor is just between her legs, man's is elsewhere, the woman is to be identified with the womb, which goes on today, reproductive health in the International Civil Society, United Nations, etc. I'm also an activist. I was at the first, uh, first um, a UN conference in 1994 as a participant from the NGO side from Bangladesh, the Cairo 1994 uh, conference on population and development, where the UN for the first time opened its doors to the NGOs. And this particular thing became very, very clear that uh, women basically were identified, worried for abortion rights or worried against enforced contraception. 
identified with their wombs. And I became popular with the, with the um, Holy See and with the Imams because I seemed to be saying something. They didn't understand what I was saying, this is, but I seemed to be saying something, questioning this. So they thought I was a pro-lifer. So I'm not talking, I'm not talking about uh, just something I'm thinking here. This instrument of abstraction on the basis of which the uh, societies are established and which we still carry in our heads. This, uh, and this particular thing is what, where I began and I also said that it, is, it goes, and thank you for your question, it goes from that part which is completely agency, what should we do in order to have a good society where women are protected. The, uh, you know, this is what brings out military enterprises today. We must rescue the women from uh, the veil and honor killing. We must go and attack the country and destroy it. So it's an alibi as well, this particular idea that uh, women are to be identified with the womb and that's, the, that, that's gender as instrument of abstraction which allows social formations to negotiate between the sacred and the profane. That's uh, one thing I said. And that's not just individuals. Maybe children, uh, as you were saying, Shannon, they, they, maybe children also negotiate this way. But what I was talking about, and we'll come to that point, individuals and collectives, I was talking really about something more uh, historical, something more collective in terms of the formation of um, social presuppositions and so on. Anyway. Um, uh, I should say also, you know, um, uh, Jane, you noticed that um, I was talking about presuppositions and you said that uh, I was influenced perhaps by Gadamer. No, my influence for this, I haven't really even read Gadamer. I mean, I know what he wrote, is it basically. My influence here comes, of course, from uh, the German ideology. That's where it uh, began. And then after that, all kinds of sociology of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, in our time. But that's where we got it, the idea that um, uh, um, the materi materiality preceded consciousness. That's, uh, that's where it comes from. And that comes from, to an extent, uh, German classical philosophy. So it's not just, uh, it's not th this latter day uh, Gadamer stuff. At any rate, so uh, the, uh, that's uh, one thing. And the other thing that I was saying yesterday was that gender moves not only from that self-conscious organization of society, I, if I'm nice, I will serve my husband well, and my husband will say, I'm a feminist, because after all, the purse strings are controlled by the little woman. And you know, benev be uh, belittling, befriending, uh, benevolent uh, sexism. This is more scary than obvious sex sexism, which you can fight. So, to an extent, the uh, that that um, uh, is one side agency. But in fact, gendering also inhabits and constructs the area of our being, which is not under our control and. Um, we would be fools if we thought we could control all of our being ourselves, that we could fully mean what we say or fully say what we mean, but gender enters there as well. And I said that there, gender is a very dangerous supplement because the idea of consent itself is questioned, which is a democratic idea. The idea because violence can be desired. That's what I said. Okay, having said this, let me first read um, uh, the poem by Yeats, which is a grand and great poem. The relationship between aesthetics and politics are so, uh, so, uh, so, um, uh, so fragile that one of Yeats's greatest poems, Easter 1916, is in fact a, 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 a sexist poem for the British, writing, he's writing as an Anglo-Irish, right? The British might have kept faith and so on and so forth. Yet, the poem is a poem of incredible grandeur. One must be able to distinguish between genuinely boring, politically correct literature, where, you know, and you know, all the gays are good, all the blacks are good, all the women are good, all the men are learning, etc. genuinely boring literature. But uh, therefore, one must keep this line clear. 
that uh, the aesthetics is not a clear line to good politics. Anyway, so here's the poem, Crazy Jane Talks with the Bishop, which completely, it's a beautiful uh, poem, but it completely internalizes the fact that anything the woman can say would have to deal with, it's a fantastic poem, will have to deal with nothing but sex. I met the bishop on the road, and much said he and I, those breasts are flat and fallen now. Those veins must soon be dry. Live in a heavenly mansion, not in some foul sty. Fair and foul are near of kin, and fair needs foul, I cried. My friends are gone, but that's a truth, nor grave nor bed denied, learned in bodily lowliness and in the heart's pride. A woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, but love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement, for nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. Now, this, is, as you see, it's a fantastic, bold poem. But we would want to say that a woman can be proud and stiff not only when on love intent. In fact, one of the problems that women are, um, are uh, assigned with is that they cannot be stiff when on love intent. And that's not a joke. You know, that is to say, the lack of a phallus. It's not a joke. So to an extent, the, that metaphor itself is, uh, uh, gives it away, we, we would say in theories of reading, that's moment of transgression, which allows that, that particular metaphor, uh, the, which allows uh, the poem to be turned around. So this poem, which is allowed, where, in fact, like many great poets, including Socrates, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, his philosophical work as maiotic, as midwifery, and so on and so forth, the, um, the many great male poets have been, in fact, have wanted to, to quote a latter-day person, devenir femme. Uh, is quoting the laws. So this is not a, this is a, a taken as a good gesture to speak as a woman could see it, and so on. But it, the problem is that what interferes is that other way of understanding uh, gender. So from this, I want to go to a, um, because I want to graduate to the brutality of the last um, shot, the, I want to go to a very beautifully uh, presented uh, gay um, uh, um, uh, uh, film made by a woman. So here is a woman who I don't know if she's, I know her well, and as I say, this film has won prizes, but I don't know if she is herself gay or straight. But she uh, is obviously making the film, right? But she uh, presents the whole film through the voiceover of a man we discover is gay, an older guy, and uh, who is himself a photographer. So you see the film, and the author, just as here in Yeats, the, it's Crazy Jane who talks. I met the bishop on the road, and much said he and I. It's not Yeats, it's Crazy Jane. In this film, cunningly, Shelley Silver, the filmmaker, is actually, has made this voice over the photographer. So in fact, the film seems to be, uh, unless you read the credits carefully, by this guy, right? And it is also very interesting because it has a scene of translation in it in terms of using the subtitling as, it's Nietzschean in that use of typography, using the subtitling as the, um, uh, a commentary on the place of translation in learning a language. Because you have, to, you have to understand that learning a language at first is a withholding of translation. This is why I was talking about the teaching of English as a second language, because it's not just we who learn uh, uh, languages, and also I was talking about translation as a convenience rather than as an active activity, activism, which is what it is in this room. <laughs> but when translation becomes, through English language translations, a convenience, then the need for the English language speakers to learn languages disappears. And this is the double bind. One of you were asking me 
about double bind and did I get it from the Stanford School and I had no idea, Palo Alto, sorry. So I had no idea that Gregory Bateson is supposed to, I'm a completely ignorant person, that Gregory Bateson, whose texts I know well from where I got double bind, I didn't know that he was supposed to be the Palo Alto School, so I learned something. But at any rate, so um, to go back, the, at first, therefore, learning a language is withholding translation. Okay, so, and then comes a, a scene where it is the ability to translate. Hmm? And then comes a scene, foreign language now, we're not talking about la first language languages. Eh? And then comes a moment, which is a much quoted phrase from the 18th Brumaire, that you forget to translate. In other words, what uh, it's a very poorly translated passage, but in the German what uh, Marx says is that you uh, do not, you forget the language which has been planted in you when you produce in the other language, the foreign language you have learned, that is you have learned the language, you've entered the lingual memory. So that whole, uh, that whole role of translating whatever we may think, and incidentally, in fact, what you were talking about wanting to be included, translation and, translation and, yeah, I really took your point. That's what's happening. But, and I'm glad you mentioned that, because I want this audience to remember, and especially Brian, when we were talking just uh, to each other, uh, a small group, after the talk, and I said, we don't want to take over the whole thing. We want to remain in the margins and be listened to from time to time. We are like the memento mori in the corner of the room, right? So to an extent, what we are talking about, I'm with you there, that that kind of clamor for inclusiveness, why it comes is we ask, and we want to be attended to as the constitutive margin, right? So, therefore, the, uh, I, what she's trying to do then, Shelley Silver, is trying to stage in the space of the subtitle, which is the space of translation in, uh, in uh, the films, she is trying to theorize this thing that I just summarized, eh? that uh, uh, withholding uh, translation, learning a language, then in the middle, ability to translate, and today for reasons uh, that we will not discuss because I've talked about before, uh, push to translate, and then finally, forgetting to translate. That particular thing, okay? So this is, the picture is of a diasporic gay guy in New York's Chinatown, okay? So the very first shot that I'm going to show, it's a long film, uh, 65 minutes actually, not that long, but still uh, it's long. The first shot that I will show, I'm showing simply because she, makes the voiceover say that this is a picture on a New York rooftop, but all signs of New York will be removed. I ask you to think through why this is important in the claim to uh, originality in the translation business today. All signs of New York will be removed. Let's see it. Okay, so this is, my mind is, this is a film made in uh, New York, right? So, uh, you know, by someone whose name is Shelley Silver. And so she's staging the scene of translation. And, you know, I, and he's saying all signs of New York will be inked out so that it looks like the real thing, the ethnic Diasporics, okay, fine. So the next one that I will show is, I'm, and wor work it out. The, as I said yesterday, the only place where, hang on a second, the only place where it, the translation is withheld is where he says mine for water because it's not exactly the same thing. He wants to claim that one in English. He's a, he's a Chinese American in Chinatown in New York. Okay, carry on, second one. And here, the presentation of the gay guy in a very lyrical way.
，我的生活一直是到处流浪。基于明显的原因，我从来没有被接受过。这里同性恋男人无家可归，特别是一个同性恋的老头子。Okay, I just wanted to present it because you know this is kind of the lyrical melancholy mode of the presentation, very unlike the, the third shot. I mean, like the third thing I'll show, not this. We are here, all alone, no way. 无土。我对这个地方的拥有，通过这些画面。照这个逻辑，我拥有这栋楼，还有这个。Mine。He doesn't say in is that that remark by diasporic can only be made in English. You work it out, and also for this you have to know a little bit all of the problems with the translation itself. And she wants to stage it so that it doesn't become a convenience for the English speaker. So carry on the next one. No picture. <laughs> no picture. No reading. You know. So to an extent, this is also that forgetting to translate. When you know, you, I mean, I'm allegorizing. It, I may be wrong, because there is no room here for being right or wrong. You know, this kind of. Uh, I am not going to theorize, but what one really needs to talk about here, and I, is the aporia of exemplarity. This is something. Beautifully staged by simply through, and it's a long film, so I'm just showing little clips. This whole stream of the staging, of the predicament of translation, is just a, truly a lesson, and you cannot understand it if you just have a Chinese friend sitting beside you saying to you, again translating what the Chinese means. I'm sorry, it won't. Uh, it won't. It won't. Uh, It won't travel that way. Okay. Is there anything else, or is that it? That's it. Okay. So, um, it, I had many more clips, but I thought, okay, now, at any rate. So, uh, what had happened with Darius Scott was that, like most readers in English, he was unable to understand. He was quoting Lacan, but he was unable to understand what the point Lacan was making. Uh, because he read it through the language of psychoanalysis, uh, La Planche and Pantalis, which is also translated, right? So he was reading the English. And he genuinely, I mean, French is not such a very remote language for English speakers. And uh, he went to Yale. He, uh, I can't even reproduce the mispronunciation of the word mise en scène, okay? So uh, uh, Lacan says, talks about the mise-en-scene of fantasy. And Darik did not realize that by mise-en-scene meant staging, the scene. Huh? And, in, and so I just kind of from uh, memory, because these are after all texts that I have taught many times, I said to him, uh, look, the word show is actually doing the work, I mean good, Graphic art, as uh, uh, Bob Hodgson well knows, there are it in fact is not uh, popular uh, stupidity 
it can be incredibly <laughs> instructive and popular doesn't mean stupid. So this comic erotic black queer fantasy in fact makes the point knowingly or unknowingly like Phil Oakes singing that song that I talk about, you know, I declare the war is over. He was doing the same thing, Texas boy, as Derrida much later did with his avenir to come. I declare the war is over. The Vietnam War was going on. So it is possible to think smart thoughts without being theoretically instructed if you are really smart. So in this particular thing, particular picture, the word show, in fact, takes us to that notion of the mise-en-scene or the staging. So what does Lacan say? Lacan says in his very powerful and wonderful um, essay called La uh, Subversion du uh, Sujet et uh, uh, le something of uh, la dialectique. Huh? Uh, it's not something. Well, uh, in 1957 to 1962 or whatever, ta I'm very bad with titles. He had to Google the title here because I know the book very well. So in this uh, essay, Lacan is saying, I, I'm not going to talk about perversion, he says, because perversion has nothing to do with uh, desire. I'm going to talk about the staging of, fan staging of desire by fantasy. And what is desire? And I'm going to come very soon to the world historical, Kant and Hegel, religion getting, becoming philosophy, individual to collective. So keep this. And Lacan himself says that what he's writing about, you can find in a metonymic form in Descartes and Kant and Hegel and uh, so on. So I'll come, to the, come there. But right here, what Lacan is saying, desire here is not located in the individual. See, that's how far. It's not Gadamer. The uh, desire is not located in the individual. Desire is something. Now, remember what I said yesterday. This is a poet trying to imagine the inside of ourselves because he is in the business of healing. Freud wanted to give back social agency to people, okay? And so therefore, like yoga, they are trying to imagine the, in except because this thing is happening at a certain time in a certain place, in fact, the scientific claims have to be very carefully made and have been made. But uh, I, I also said that poetry is not a bad word in my, poetry trumps the, uh, Stefano, the uh, science of killing whales every time. So what, um, uh, what uh, Lacan is doing there is he's saying that when the ego is about to develop, and I can't go into everything, but it begins in a signifier, it's like a, information technology not meaningful, not meaningful. Anybody who does even simple information technology knows informatics in the beginning, the units are not meaningful, hyphen, right? So the unconscious is like a conveyor belt, which is going like that, and it's not meaningful, no meaning there. But the way we are made, says Lacan, imagining and drawing these pictures about which he says exceedingly funny things, the, uh, so the, the way we are made, something in the infant as that conveyor belt is going, ta -da -da, hits one of those, one of those um, uh, panels. And it becomes meaningful in the sense of signifying, making into a sign, not in the sense of um, you know, meaning, but that way. And it makes classically an unreal meaning, and Lacan's sentence is, the dog says meow and the cat says bow wow. Okay, that's his, like, that is his uh, sentence to show that that sentence, which then begins to, that moment of hitting, which begins to run meaning making, is not based on, and which spells for us in future, real, the real is not necessarily based on a correct transcription of what we will come to call reality. It could be correct also, doesn't matter. Like a stopped analogic clock gives the correct time twice a day. So the thing is, that, but the whole point is 
that that's not the point. It could be correct. I mean, it isn't necessarily wrong, but that's not the point. What's, uh, okay. Now, at that point, says Lacan, it's a very complex text, and I'm summarizing as fast as I can. Uh, the, at that point, says Lacan, what happens is that the part of us, remember what I was saying about the metapsychological, etc., and I was being pious, infants, etc., if one really pays attention to this, it's the ethical is not based on, the ethical is based on a grounding error, as it were. But the, I'm not going there. At any rate, so at that point, the part of uh, the being that relates to this in order to produce the ego finally, and think of a baby with nothing uh, there, right? So, I mean, uh, moving its arms and legs, etc. but it's becoming human. So, uh, what attaches is the way we are written in terms of the drives. Very bad English translation of uh, the word, German word trip is instinct. Can you imagine that the Alex Trecci translation translates this completely dehuman word drive that's moving the being before the ego comes into being as instinct? The ridiculous psychologization of what these people are talking about. Just And that famous sentence, of course, you know very well, Freud saying, I did not want to put Latin words, but very common words. This is very, very well known. And therefore, I will say, ish and is, I and it. And the English translation is, I do not want to put Latin words, therefore, I will say ego and id. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, this, the scandal of the translation of psychoanalysis. So this is what... This is what Lacan is talking about. Lacan is saying the part that attaches is the part of drives. And, uh, the, uh, and that's not accessible to the being. And what does it attach to? And this is a complete other argument. Again, I can't make it. Someone asked me if I was showing off. No, I mentioned these things so that you can look up those things so that you can see whether I'm right or wrong. What is there for me to show off? The only thing I can show off is that I didn't know the name of the Palo Alto group. But the thing is so, the, what, this uh, stuff relates to all of the border parts of the body, okay? Like the ears, the mouth, the nostrils, the uh, breathing apparatus, the little hole on the top of the penis, of course, the vagina, the uh, armpits, and so on. Now, all of this is, is something, the, the poetry of this attaching to the borders of the body, because they communicate. And you know, the story that you were telling me, is, that, is it your wisdom looking out? No, it's your stupidity looking in. Those are the holes. I mean, the, here the story was, it's a fantastic story. It was, those are the, th that was a piece of uh, cloth, but it's the same thing, it's metaphor, right? So these are the holes through which we permeate borders or we respect borders. So border thinking, the drive attaches to this, okay? Now, says Lacan, this attachment cannot be uh, specular. There can be no reflection of this in the ego, no mirror image because this is underived, we would say. Okay, Lacan doesn't say it, but it's a word that belongs to another school of thinking. But we would say it's underived, the underived real, because there's no ego there yet. And then, and that's where desire is located. The, in the, in the, in the, um, see, in the staging of desire in fantasy, the desire, this is normal, this is not a perversion. The desire is claimed for the individual. And when it, this is fantasy. So this is, and the basic fantasy of course is the will to power through knowledge. Desire is claimed. So everything that I've been saying here is poetically rendered in this account by Lacan. This is so, to an extent, this desire becomes um, claimed in fantasy, and then you can make mirror images and so on and so forth, okay? This completely non-specular, not open to speculation thing 
that happens so that the ego can come into being. And Lacan says that in Descartes, donc, je pense, donc je suis. And that's not in the Latin. It's in the French translation. Eh? The ergo and donc in, are not exactly, it, it's not a real proper translation. Uh, because in the, in, the, in the Latin, there is no je, right? It's inflected in the verb. Cogito mm? ergo sum. So that, uh, and th Lacan says that in that scene of translation in the Descartes, in the donc, the, what I'm talking about uh, is the je, is the important, the moi, the ego. It's the important thing, it's a metonym. It's a metonym of what I'm talking about. In Hegel, especially in the fantastically written, oh boy, I mean, that I have read very recently. And the, and the graduation into, you have to read it in German because Miller's translation is hopeless. The, the graduation from the non-subject into the subject is so beautifully staged by Hegel. I'm speaking of the page just before the opening of, uh, of uh, the master-slave dialectic and the phenomenology. You read that paragraph and you can see the guy, I mean, smart as smart can be, control of the language, which is again as great as a poet's. If you go back and take a look at it there, and you will see how Hegel is trying to talk, he's being Eurocentric, of course, it's also the transition from feudalism into capitalism, right? But that's not the point. So he's trying to show, and so Lacan says it's metonymic in Hegel, because he's trying to show the same thing. Uh, the subject is emerging from just being a plaything of world history, the epistemograph of uh, phenomenology. The subject is emerging as acting subject which is exactly what Lacan is talking about, as a metonym in Hegel. So therefore, this is what the guy who thought he was just doing because he's himself a black gay guy, identitarianism, uh, he's, how cool can it be? He's showing a uh, black erotic comic. That's why I said I'm cleaning up like that joke about the elephant. See, I'm uh, looking at what I was saying yesterday. For me, this really marginal text, which I'm not showing as a result of, uh, although you didn't censor me, uh, the, uh, as a result of the conversation, I'm not showing it because you would probably be d deflected in another direction. But uh, the, uh, I'm finding in such a very marginal text the place where in fact, if you attend to its metonymic nature for all of this discourse, you will see that our predicament of the will to power through knowledge silencing us when we value our own activity over everything else as if it is a teleological narrative, that predicament is put it is staged if we know how to read in that word show, which does indeed lead us back to this uh, staging, mise en scène of, and that pointer was given to me because he was showing off also with Lacan, but he didn't know, you see, this is why I say, sometimes translation as convenience can take away the right to intellectual labor because the guy couldn't read. The right to intellectual labor is not just down below with the illiterate and the, and I'm, I'll come to the point of the misuse of unmediated cyber technology uh, by us in the interest of numbers, democracy as numbers, you know, mathematics, arithmetic, uh, uh, when I end. So that's what I was going to do with the uh, queer theoretical texts. Now, the, um, I said that I would move from individual to collective. Now, let me stay with individual a little bit more. Let me talk about religion just a moment, and then I will go into the collective. Uh, the, uh, the many of the reason why post-structuralism is thought of as, uh, as uh, uh, related to ethno-philosophies is indeed because, and why, uh, possessive individualists criticize it on both sides, you know, from extreme right and extreme left as denying agency, is because most of the great religious traditions place the will in alterity, not in us. En la sua voluntade e nostra pace. This is a, this is a sentence that uh, is known worldwide. Hmm? Dante's extraordinary uh, line, in his will 
is our peace. So to that or in the Bengali song that I sang on television, which is often shown as a buffer, it's Shakuli uh, Tomari Itcha, Itcha Mo Itara Tumi. Your Itcha is the will. Hmm? So everything is your will. You, uh, the goddess Tara, you are the one who is will endowed, Itcha Mo eh? So this idea within religions that the place of the will is in alterity, not in me. This is why the uh, historians have suggested that people before uh, they become um, super educated find in religious discourse the world historical. When they bring religion to crisis for resistance. This is the argument of uh, Ranajit Guha, subaltern studies, elementary 30 years ago. He published a fantastic book, Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency. And he says that the peasant found, and you know, some of them were converted millenarian Christians, Bishamunda. Huh? They found, so it's not just uh, tribal religion, also Christianity. So uh, they found in religion the world historical. And this is Rosa Luxemburg saying the spontaneity, she's not talking about um, religion there, she's, her theory of spontaneity is world history speaking through the uh, uneducated individual. That's, that's, so it's not from Gadamer. It's a, it's a huge conglomerate of thinking. So that's her, uh, her uh, definition of spontaneity. Du Bois, in his fantastic book that I was referring to, Black Reconstruction in America, which nobody reads, they just read because this is more convenient, uh, The uh, Souls of Black Folk. It's, it's certainly a good book, but this one, 1935, is a fantastic book where he is trying to understand uh, emancipation and the formation of so-called democracy in the United States as a play of capital. But then he has a whole wonderful chapter after these things, which is called The Coming of the Lord, where he understands that the, uh, that the, um, uh, that the illiterate slave understood through black Christianity the world historical. So, you know, and this before the incursion of the evangelicals into Africa, which is really sapping will, I'm, I come and go in Africa all the time, I'm going again in July, uh, the, uh, uh, a certain class did claim black Christianity as also a mode of liberation. So certainly the Dalits in India do. I've talked about this myself, but it is dependent upon a historical moment when access to the religious, which already has within it the idea that will is elsewhere, takes us out of individual will into the world historical. It, this is a very different moment from institutional religion. So in this particular place, the, um, the very learned ones, however, Kant and Hegel, I'm thinking about Hegel, Kant more than Hegel, but Hegel talks more about world history. They are talking about uh, sublating, um, aufhebing religion into uh, theology, into philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's what they so that laundered Christianity becomes philosophy, becomes the unacknowledged religious for a certain race class fixed secularism. Wonderful arguments, I'm not saying anything wrong with the arguments, these are tremendous philosophers. But that's what they're marking, and this is a tremendous class difference, so that the unlettered um, are finding in the religious uh, an access to world history. Sorel is talking about myth, Rosa Luxemburg is talking about left thinking itself as something like a religion. It's not like people don't know this on, uh, on the left when it was working. And so, and says that this is spontaneity, right? So, and at the same time, the great European philosophers are diagnosing, they're saying that we now, we, thanks to colonialism, we're in touch with the world, okay. At this point, what do we see? We see the word cosmopolitheia coming in, right? And uh, it's the, 
uh, Plato, as I have said many a time, and I believe also in the published stuff. So again, I'm not showing off. They can just go there and find a better explanation, okay? So the um, Plato, uh, Plato only wrote about a single town, city, Athens, Polytheia, constitutions, right? It's not called the Republic. This I've said a million times. Republic is bad translation. And why is it a very bad translation? Because the res publica came in with the Romans. So it is a, a, a completely wrong translation. But people don't uh, acknowledge it. It's called constitutions and politeia. And if Plato doesn't much like democracy, you know that. But uh, so whatever uh, you want to say, Kant says we are in touch with, and you know, in the political writings it's clear, we are in touch with the world, and why did he say so? Just the same reason that Goethe said uh, because of colonialism. We are in touch with the world. Remember today we say in the same way we are in touch with the globe, and so therefore we must be global, except we've mistranslated the word uh, word um, cosmopolitea, which should be world governance cosmopolitics. And I just want to read a, f a thing. I haven't read Sherry Simon, and from what you said, she doesn't say this. But if this comes in, Saskia Sassen certainly does, then we have to watch it. It is also a very grave mistranslation of cosmopolitea. So uh, let us rescue the word into its political meaning, a constitution for the world an abstract juridical legal structure that must match the abstractions of globality. It is not enough to hang on a colloquial sense, you know, the Orient Express and smoking Sobrania cocktails. I'm sure nobody here knows what Sobrania cocktails are. Does anyone? No. Okay, it, they used to be cigarettes with multicolored filters, you know, and only the cosmopolitan smoked Sobrania cocktails. <laughs> you see? So, anyway, so, the, uh, the, so um, it is not enough to hang on a colloquial sense and suggest, as does Bruce Robbins, that vernacular cosmopolitanism is just a change of definition. In order for a corrective vernacular cosmopolitanism to work, there must be a world governmentalized evenly. That is so much not the case. I mean, we know. This is why we can take advantage of a certain kind of cyber literacy thinking that we are continuing the missionary work by accessing just numbers when friendship, the biggest um, ingredient, greater love hath no man. I think about uh, David and Jonathan. Huh? And that has been impersonalized into numbers and we take advantage of that and we think that the missionary moment still exists, whereas there was a civilizing mission and I'm speaking as an example of that civilizing mission as I have been saying about the missionary school even as I was at the top of the agency. So I'll come back to that. Anyway, so in order for there to be vernacular cosmopolitanism, there has to be a world governmentalized evenly. To suggest now that global minorities, mostly in cities, and the spectralization of the rural is completely ignored, and about that also, I'm sorry to say, I have written. If you want, you can ask me. So, the, uh, in order for, yes, to suggest now that global minorities, labor export, paperless immigrant women achieve cosmopolitanism is to forget that they must exist in race class divided situations where it is impossible to feel or exercise the sense of general equality that must be the definitive predication of epistemic cosmopolitanism. In other words, in the face of our desire, you know, it's the desire of the middle class, it's Pato Chatterjee's theory of political society, when we ourselves want civil society, to say, oh la la, the poor are really doing a political society when he wouldn't be caught dead in that kind of a situation. This is our own bad faith need to be, uh, to deny our complicity with what's happening. In other words, in the face of our desire to declare vernacular cosmopolitanism, we must ask who pulls the strings or have these people become so-called cosmopolitan because of other people's demand that trade flow? The humanities question is the subject position question. Who pulls the strings and what happens in moments of crisis? The restricted solidarities, unregarding of national origin, because of immigrant oppression, cannot be called cosmopolitanism. 
This particular thing is, in fact, a mistranslation based on a mistranslation. First of all, the relationship between the Republic and Plato is hard to match when we are not reading the Politeia in Greek because we think it's called Republic. It has nothing to do with anything. Whereas Plato is obviously redoing it because of colonialism, we have access to a cosmos, which is the word closest to globe, right? So therefore, the, this idea of cosmopolitanism is something that we have to put aside when we think about moving from individual to collective in terms of the placement of the will in something else. That does not make us will less or weak. It gives us a stronger practice because like the strongest uh, practitioners, it makes us aware of our limits. If you're not aware of your limits, look ma, no hands, that is a self-infantilized notion of success. So to an extent, that, that particular thing is what, where Rosa Luxemburg says at the, in the, if I can find the passage that I went back to, yes, there we go, says in her, in her, um, in her uh, mass strike, Remarking about the 1905 general strike in the Russian Empire, and I quote in English, the Russian Revolution has for its next task the establishment of a modern civil democratic constitutional state. Now, the, anybody who knows history knows that these people, first of all, Rosa Luxemburg herself was killed, but these people were set aside as mere social democrats. And on the other side came vanguardism. Why Vanguardism was certainly necessary because the so-called Bolshevik Revolution was, was uh, unexpectedly won because of the fact that there was no um, civil democratic constitutional state on the other side. It was not like the French Revolution. So to an, extent, to, to an extent, the idea that it was, and then came what? Right after that, the incredible opposition, brest Treaty, New Economic Program, all that stuff, there was no time to, uh, uh, for its next task, the establishment of a modern civil democratic constitutional state. Therefore, we had the theory of vanguardism, that the vanguard will bring class consciousness into the masses, that's not a good, uh, good idea, because that is, in fact, a failure of an idea of education in the sense that I was talking about the first day. And I'm not the only one to say this. You should look at the works of Theodore Shanin. There are many others, but Shanin's work, he was himself, his name is not uh, Theodore Shanin, it's a Russian name, uh, S-H-A-N-I-N. You know, the idea that there was no practice of freedom available to the masses, and therefore, the vanguardist idea is not the one that could have worked and didn't work. And these other people, who were the Social Democratic Party in Germany, was the biggest communist party in the world at that point, these other people, and Rosa Luxemburg is writing from within that, they were uh, called, you know, sort of liberal Democrats and so on and so forth, and that was written out of court. And it is from within this, uh, this scene that we also, I hope you will agree, I mean, I, I'll give you the, the little thing, keyword on general strike that I've written for Rethinking Marxism, your university. Uh, so um, uh, I hope you will agree that Gramsci arises within this particular, this particular problematic, right? And so what did Gramsci, and I'm coming to the tr translation business, I'm not far from the translation argument ever. In fact, before I go to Gramsci, this idea, modern civil democratic constitutional state. The, the interesting thing is, Rosa Luxemburg is not saying bürgerliche Gesellschaft. She is saying Rechtsstaat. Huh? Rechtsstaat, which is a little bit, and on the other hand, the English translation, bourgeois, some British Marxist, little Britain Marxist, eh? Uh, decided that because also more uh, Zizek style Leninist and therefore of course Rosa Luxemburg is only a social democrat, decided to translate Rechtsstaat as bourgeois. And that word bourgeois carries with it 
not just the descriptive power of describing the French Revolution, it is a nasty word. That so he makes, the translator makes Rosa Luxemburg say in the English translation of the mass strike that Russia should then have built a bourgeois state. Right? Now, this, this is even Bürgerliche Gesellschaft should be translated civil society, Bürgerlich, civil, kivitas, relating to the town, rather than bourgeois, which is the French word which has in English another kind of nuance. So this is also a very big mistranslation which has circulated. Today, in the new translation, the translator recognizes that you cannot, Rechtsstaat cannot be translated with just a word. And so therefore, there is this whole panoply of words, modern, civil democratic, constitutional state, whatever. But that's very recent. So to an extent, then I will move in, into Gramsci. Gramsci actually read it, although he de did read German. He read it, uh, this was written just after the 1905 strikes, when the world was different. And Gramsci read it in, after the 1917 revolution, because it was translated into Italian in 1919. So uh, the whole thing has changed. And Gramsci's only experience of a strike is the failed uh, strike in Turin. And Gramsci in 1920, now Gramsci was himself incredibly involved in the establishment of the, of the Italian Communist Party and so on. Therefore, the reason why Turin failed was because all the parties did not come together, there was squabbling and so on. And as you know, in 1926, Gramsci was jailed. Now, once Gramsci was jailed, before he was jailed, he, as a dirigent, as a chair, chair kind of person, wrote very gung-ho about the Turin proletariat, okay? Like they had really, but always epistemological. That they had really learned the epistemological lesson of Marx. They thought of themselves not as victims of capitalism or workers wanting job security, but as agents of production. This is the epistemological lesson of the only book Marx wrote, Capital One, the uh, agents of production. And Gramsci constantly gives support to the Turin proletariat. But once, and he's already the last essay that he started writing before going to prison, which is um, elements uh, uh, of the Southern question, Already, and this is, he's not writing this as a dirigent, but as an intellectual. Already his tone has changed. He is talking about what I now call supplementing vanguardism, that is to say, producing the practice of freedom in people who are not, who are broken by another kind of education. There's a lot of stuff that Gramsci sitting in jail thought, which was not possible to test out, therefore, people also say he was exactly like Mussolini's system of education, etc. Forget it, that's not the argument I'm trying to make. But within his notes, which are only now being translated as notes or journals in prison rather than books written by Gramsci with theories of hegemony and so on, he focuses completely on the production of the subaltern intellectual, I've said this before, in fact, in New York, the subaltern intellectual, where the intellectual, like me, be, gets into a master-disciple relationship. He's, re, as a philosopher, a very smart guy. He is rewriting Hegel, because Hegel only has master-slave, and then another, another uh, chapter, which brings you in to reason. The next chapter, when the subject emerges, it's a full clear other chapter, it's called reason. Mm -hmm. But Gramsci actually uh, redoes uh, the uh, master-slave idea into a master-disciple idea. Whereas we, one can go through all kinds of uh, translated deliberate misreadings like Fanon reading Hegel at the end of Black Skin, White Masks, where most people like to focus on where he's breaking with negritude, they think that's the real Fanon. You know, like the experience, lived experience of being black. Fanon put that aside and went to read Hegel and claim Hegel for himself, misreading in translation. And you have to look at Hippolyte's translation and where Fanon is. These are examples of mistranslations that have had effect. And you know, you were talking about the effects of the translation of the Bible. 
Marx is only 200 years, but the mistranslations of Marx have made blood flow. Okay, so to an extent, this, these we have to take into account when we are talking about individual to collective, and in an earlier dispensation, the unlettered claiming religion as world and access to world history, whereas the lettered are laundering Christianity into, the, the, into philosophy and secularism. So we cannot, in fact, keep the civilizing mission impulse as if it is not affected by that history. So, and uh, the, um, as I should say, all, all, no, I won't say that. So, um, I must, I told you that I would speak slightly longer, but this, this is it, I'm coming to the end. So therefore, when we are looking at this particular thing, Luxembourg has a faith that the abstract structures of the state to be claimed by the citizen, uh, it will be the way in which the subaltern becomes, gets out of the circuit of subalternity. Gramsci, on the other hand, says the intellectual must be in a master-disciple relationship where the intellectual is the disciple and the master is the environmental text that the intellectual must learn from how to produce a subaltern intellectual. Now, you will see that this is very close to how I was describing my work where I'm failing. Gramsci never had the chance of failing because he sat in jail and died in jail. But this is the kind of work which does not succeed uh, too easily. It has to be it's a persistent work. But I didn't know that, this, that there was a similarity. Your question about Gadama really made me want to say this. I didn't know that there was a similarity between what I was doing and what Gramsci had said about the intellectual as disciple to the environment in order to learn from below. I've been teaching Gramsci since the 60s the, no, not 60s, uh, the 1978 for the first time in, um, in Texas, not in Iowa. So the, I've been teaching Gramsci for many, many years, and I've been doing this work since 1986, right? And so, last, year before last, when I'm teaching Gramsci uh, at Columbia, I suddenly begin to see, my God, what an imagination this young man had that sitting in a jail cell, he could think this one through. And it took me 30 years of experience to uh, think about this this way. And so it's really a kind of alliance. I'm not saying that I'm as great as Ramshi. I'm saying a cat can look at a king. The, it's a kind of alliance rather than being influenced. Because as I said, when one is translating, one is sinking or swimming in, uh, in the same way when one is teaching in this kind of a place where one doesn't know what the minds of the students are like because, because of one's own millennial cognitive crimes. One is not thinking. I'm not thinking Dewey, Freire, Montessori, Gramsci. No, not even Angbedkar. I'm not thinking any of that. I'm, as I said uh, to you, um, um, Edwin, it's abreactive. Later, one thinks, what the hell was going on? In that way, in the, in the Columbia classroom, I thought of uh, this alliance with Gramsci, and now I emphasize it, I find strength in it, and I'm also sorry that dying at 46 in jail, he did not have uh, the opportunity to teach us more by failing, because he would have failed. It, you know, it does, it's the failure, who wins, loses there. It's, a, it's an absolute mistake to think that one has won in this one. It's like history, it goes on. Anyway, so the, uh, the next thing that I wanted to say was that this, uh, if one thinks of religion, and there's no transi transition here, because as I said, I came to hear you, so the morning time of organization, I kind of sacrificed to my friend's speech. But at any rate, so no transition, please don't mind. If one wants to think about religion in the way that some of us have, uh, and nobody who uh, respects poetry can dismiss religion, and I certainly don't have any desire to be um, helped by the religious, the, but what I do feel is that religion, and this is something that I discovered when I was asked to give the William James lecture at Harvard Divinity School. I spoke of uh, the, a, a woman called Sharada Muni Mukherjee. She is known as 
Shri Maha, Ramakrishna's wife. The, uh, Ramakrishna was an ecstatic. His wife, in fact, initiated my father in 1920. My father, like me, lost his faith, as I did, but this fact remained extreme. And I have written about her as an ethical rather than a religious person, so that what comes from her uh, sayings is not something that relates to a named religion. But at any rate, I'm trying to present her in, the, in a way that would not, would, not, uh, would not insult my father's teacher, I had my sister be in the audience so that she would know that I, she could tell me, had I been true to my intellectual principles and not insulted in, in this crowd of gringos, I had not insulted the, um, see I'm remembering the Alamo, uh, I had not, <laughs> had not insulted this woman. Hmm? Okay, so the, what I found myself saying was this, that the religion as a poetic system, you know, and remember poetry is not a bad word to me, it's not like the aesthetic is not anything. It, it is constantly re-transcendentalized because we need an intuition of the transcendental. It's constantly re-transcendentalized in a different way by the imagination. Whereas what happens in its mobilizability, even in its being a place to find the world historical, is, and it's dependent upon class apartheid in education, but also high up. It, what happens in its mobilizability is that that thing, imagination, which is neither rational nor irrational, is brought into the small, morally lazy enclosure of mere reason into belief. Belief belongs to mere reason. Believing belongs to mere reason. So faith is even worse because faith is unreasoned belief. Whereas the uh, opening the, where religion can hang out the, is in that uh, re-transcendentalized re space which is neither reasonable nor unreasonable, exceedingly hard to claim. So in that context, I would say that ending where I, be, I, w I began, I, would, I will repeat what I said just a minute ago. As I keep insisting, I'm not only an example of that civilizing mission where the missionaries uh, shared the Bible. You know this, I, my gratitude to my school, and I was even talking at a meal about my uh, becoming more and more like the, princ my pr the principal of my school. She's my ra role model, Ms. Charuala Dash. Uh, untouchable adjective, um, last name, not Chatterjee. Eh? The Bengali Brahmins, that's a, maybe in Pune, but that's a Bengali Brahmin. Uh, the Chatterjees, Chakravortis, and so on. And just, I'll take just a, a single moment to say this. The post-colonial stuff in India is generally controlled by the Bengali Brahmins, and most of them, and I said at this at the MLA, you know, we are sitting there post-colonial, ah, Bengali Brahmin women. They claim indigeneity, and that is very bad faith. A Brahmin is not indigenous. And also, generally speaking, they are English uh, honor students and English professors and so on. They would not be caught dead studying Bengali honors or anything. And there's a lot of Bengali work which questions this uh, rewriting of Pascal Casanova. And the person that one is thinking of in terms of this old banal um, redoing of novels and uh, uh, the British, is of course Mon Kim Chandra and Walter Scott and stuff. And Harish Trivedi, the first time I saw him, he's also English. He was chairman of the English department. I told Harish in, in the United States, I didn't know him. I said, Harish, why are you spouting these Sanskrit tags that everybody knows? You don't know Sanskrit, but you're trying to impress this white audience here with your Sanskrit. Why, do you, why are you doing that? Don't you respect yourself? So to an extent, the uh, Trivedi, three Vedas, that's a Brahmin. Uh, so, the, uh, therefore, the, this uh, uh, caste uh, fixed, I say to Partha Chatterjee, in public and in, pub in writing, Partha, what do you think? Bengal is India and India is the world and you write a book on nationalism. So, this particular, Gauri Vishwanathan, not a Bengali, but a Tambram, a Brahmin. The, therefore, she also, in her Masks of Conquest, I read it as a dissertation, Edward was the, was the director, and I said, Edward, ask your student to do some English, uh, some Indian language work. 
the upper classes were completely collaborative. And so this idea, I mean, Michael Mudhushan Dutta and Vonkim Chandra and so on, all English honor students, they all went to my college, English department, my department, students of Derosio. So to an extent, this very caste fixed self-representation as indigenous. I was talking about the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, the fundamentalists, coming into huge, many schools in the, in the world, coming into Washington, talking about this indigeneity and Hinduism, and second generation, we shouldn't be like second generation Indian Americans, they were flocking. We took out a thing, I can show you a picture of my co the cords in my throat standing out, because I'm standing on a bucket across that huge thing, we took out permission for talking, and I'm screaming at the top of my voice, citing Indian critics of this kind of unexamined Brahminism and claiming this, because these Hindus were taking in these diasporic kids by saying, we are against white racism. That's a joke. It's out of the Brahmins that Aryanism came. Are we joking here? So, you know, this is, so to an extent, from within, I will say that that stuff, beware of the Bengali Brahmins as representing themselves, being one myself, as representing themselves as Indian indigeneity, and always English honor students, and somehow uh, uh, the, um, you know, the representative of the rest of the world was trying not to be racist. Be careful there, truly, I'm not joking. And so to come back and say, so now somebody said to me, I was very happy to see that you also spoke against the Bengalis, I thought you only spoke against us. No, was it you, Bob? No, perhaps it was you. I don't know, somebody from this outfit. But at any rate, so as I keep insisting, we are not only, I mean, David Damrosh thinks that Tagore is an indigenous uh, writer. He's discovering Tagore. You know, when I was talking about Marie Antoinette playing at Milkmaids, I was talking about Tagore. Anyway, so uh, I, uh, as I keep insisting, I'm not only an example of that civilizing mission, but paradoxically also the agent of that ancient, uh, heteropractical civilization uh, hatched by the caste system, Brahminical caste system. So I offer this in the spirit of friendly autocritique as I also teach in the country of the kings, right? I teach English in the United States and I could, dressed in costume, present myself as an indigenous because certainly I know much more Bengali and Sanskrit than most of these people. So therefore, I'm also on this cusp so I offer this in the spirit of friendly autocritique. We rethink translation studies as industry again and again, and rethink the taking advantage of unexamined cyber literacy where numbers are substituted for the religion of love. The uh, friendship is impersonalized into nothing but numbers. Think again of what happens. I mean. Put your hand on your chest and think, I'm not a religious person. Is this how one, in fact, is this cultural mediation? And is this, is this kind of empty digital idealism, the end of which are the drones that kill? Is this the way in which that wonderful impulse, is this the way in which the Prince of Peace should speak today? So to an extent, the, I would say that the, uh, the um, uh, essay by, uh, by Derrida called Interpretations at War, when he talks about the emergence of the uh, word Judeo-Christian in 1948, one should begin to think about how, in fact, sacred story becomes uh, the excuse for war and, uh, and violence and retaliation, not only in uh, Africa. And Gandhi has written about how, uh, how uh, teachers of literature must take those narratives into their hand and show that they would not be um, excuses for genocide. But that has to be done also in the Western world by supposedly the only democracy in the Middle East. The idea that a sacred story can become uh, a, an excuse for um, unbelievable retaliatory state legitimized violence. So it seems to me that we cannot just go any way we want when we carry so heavy a burden, the burden of indeed, if you believe, you believe that it is uh, as indeed is Islam. These are 
messages of peace. So to an extent, I would say, uh, the, as in conclusion, that here, Shannon, is where I'm with you in using uh, the idea of translation. You see, this, is, this here is a book called A World I Loved, called A World I Love, I've written, uh, no, loved, good. Wadad Makdisi Kortas, upper class Lebanese Quaker, uh, born, I think, in 1916. And uh, she, uh, this book has to be read with Khaled Ziadeh's book, Neighborhood and Boulevard, educated at the Sorbonne, but uh, an inhabitant I, older than I of Tripoli in Lebanon. Both of these people write about the denial through that, what you were talking about, uh, Edwin, about the denial and translation in this larger sense of these um, Ottoman cosmopolitan countries, Christian but uh, living within, it says, an Arab woman, the story of an Arab woman, even as we remember the Arab tradition of translation, of the retranslation of that as Islamic. Khalid Ziadeh's book is extraordinary in the way in which France established 103 mosques in that city where they were living before. I mean, it's a fantastic book, and it's been translated, Palgrave. So, and this one is in English. She wrote it in Arabic, and then she wrote it again in English. So in order to see the vestiges of that translation, upon which much of our, yesterday I was mentioning Afghanistan. I'm now mentioning the Holy Land. In order, this is a woman, and that's a man. The, in order to see the, uh, cult, the, fa the successful cultural mediation for, some, for the sort of division that produces violence, because religion is a site which can, it seems to me that we should also look at texts of this sort. So this, uh, I didn't organize myself well today. I therefore uh, summarize as best I can. I uh, first spoke about gender as uh, instrument of abstraction and took the great poem by Yeats as an example of aesthetic splendor which expresses the narrative of that kind of identification of woman with uh, what is between her legs and has a transgressive metaphor which allows us to turn it around. That uh, I began there. Then I presented uh, Shelley Silver's use of the subtitle as text in order to create a discourse about, this is like living on, right? The, the, the subtitle space. Also the book called Derrida by Jeffrey Bennington, the sub, uh, yes. Uh, so, Sir Confession, is, that one's called. At any rate, so the, this, uh, her use of the subtitular, subtitular space to stage the predicament of translation, especially within the diasporic so-called, and I quote, cultural capital of the world. It begins, uh, I began with an erasure of that space in order to claim indigeneity, which I later put at the door of Bengali Brahmins. So uh, then I moved into the idea, the, how I take the violent um, queer representation in a popular form as showing the f fault lines of the entire intellectual enterprise depending upon a correct reading, and the, I stand by the word correct, a correct reading of Lacan. From there, I move into the, my second point, which is religion as access to the world historical when nothing else is available. And the concurrence historically in, in uh, Europe of the sublation or aufhebung of religion into, as the very task of Europe, into philosophy and secularism. And I related it today to another tremendous mistranslation, polytheia as republic and cosmopolytheia as cosmopolitanism rather than as the cosmopolitical or world governance or constitutions, world constitutions. Then I moved to the idea 
without transition to the idea, I talked a, uh, to the idea of Rosa Luxemburg's asking for the structure of the state and its relationship to vanguardism and today's, uh, today the, the, the other thing is more useful, the structures of the state. There, there's another story which I'm not telling, the decimation of the state, let's forget it. So from, uh, from Rosa Luxemburg, I moved into Gramsci, who was more active, and how in Gramsci's work, moving from involvement in building a party into, alas, the, uh, the extended leisure of jail, he began to develop the idea of the production of the subaltern intellectual, where the intellectual becomes instrumental in learning to learn from below, disciple and the culture is the master. Because the subaltern, like I said the first day, is not capable of knowing, because of class apartheid in education, what he or she ought to want for the betterment of, because this is freedom from, not freedom to. So, and from there, uh, altogether without, uh, without transition, I spoke about religion as a cusp place of the tying of Imagination, capital I, not Kantian, not in influenced by that one. Capital I into the small, morally lazy, and this is Kant, morally lazy space of mere reason or belief. Belief is tied to mere reason. And then I moved on into uh, the use of uh, the opportunities of cyber literacy which comes with the feudalism of giving means of subsistence to the poor rather than this uh, right to intellectual labor, connecting it to the denial of intellectual labor also at the top, sometimes thanks to the translation industry into English as a convenience rather than as here as an active practice. So um, I hope at least this summary which I've tried to give as slowly as possible and which is also uh, video, being videographed, 